It is my pleasure to welcome you again to our final series. What a great year we've had exploring pertinent issues such as municipal bankruptcies, water, and tonight, health care. All pressing issues in our society that our school strives to provide solutions to. My name is Jim Lewis. I have the pleasure of serving as chair of the Leadership Council for the USC Price Athenian Society. And my day job is also a privilege. I get to serve as city manager of Pismo Beach. Let me tell you, that's a tough job. <laughs> Your next vacation may very well be in Pismo Beach. This is my commercial. It is the only location in the country where you can enjoy a classic beach town, a world-class wine region, and prime surfing within 10 minutes of each other. Look that up. ClassicCalifornia.com, Pismo Beach. Okay, the council's happy now. I'm mean, good. Okay. <laughs> the Athenian Society is the premier philanthropic support group for the Sol Price School of Public Policy. Athenian Society members, and you'll see us with our pens here this evening, are committed to the mission of the USC Price School to improve the quality of life for people and communities here and abroad. If you're a member of the Athenian Society, I know several of you are here in the front, could you please rise? Please stand and be recognized. Thank you for your commitment to our school. Nice to see you. you can join us by supporting the school with an annual gift of $1,500 or more per year. There are materials throughout the room, and you can see any one of us. We'd love to talk to you about joining us in the Athenian Society. Membership provides you, among other things, access to cutting-edge research and scholarship taking place at the school, and a host of networking and professional development opportunities. And today at our board meeting, we discussed several neat opportunities for this summer. So this would be a great time to join the Athenian Society. You will also be invited to events such as this one and other insider events where we get to really learn what's on our dean's mind as he works through many of the pressing issues in our school. So I'm sure you're eager to hear what our experts have to say on health care reform. But before that, it is my pleasure to introduce our Dean Jack Knott. He's our Dean of the School of Saul Price School of Policy. He holds the C. Irwin and Ion L. Piper Dean's Chair. And let me just share, we were talking earlier, the Dean has several uh, boards. He's a past president of the National Association of Public Administration and the International Association of Schools of Public Affairs. But I'm proud of our Dean because he has taken our school to new heights in faculty recruitment, fundraising, student recruitment. He's raised the profile of our school and I'm just, I'm very proud to introduce my friend and our dean, Dean Jack Knott. Uh, so on behalf of the Soul Price School, I want to welcome you to this Dean Speaker Series event. Uh, it's uh, great to have all of you attend. It's great to see such a wonderful audience here this evening. Uh, it, this isn't this a wonderful venue. Uh, I was a member of the City Club till about last year. I think I quit a little too soon now that I see their new digs. Uh, but uh, it's, we're pl pleased that we can hold it here at this uh, beautiful place. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank our event sponsors. And I ask you please to hold your applause until I've uh, mentioned who all these sponsors are. And uh, we'll recognize them as a group. First, Healthcare Financial Management Association of Southern California, the LCW Liebert Cassidy Whitmore, Keenan and Associates, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, Healthcare Executives of Southern California, and the Medical Development Specialists Consulting. So would members of those organizations that are here please stand up and let us recognize you for your support of this group. Thank you all very much. Without your support, this uh, event certainly wouldn't be possible, and so uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, now, the Affordable Care Act certainly has become the focus of national attention, and understandably so. Uh, there may be no single more important domestic policy issue and economic issue facing our country especially with our concerns about the quality, uh, the cost, and the access to health care. You know, our country's lagged behind many other advanced economies in health insurance coverage and in access to care. In addition, our health outcomes for the money that we spend also do not look very favorable compared to those other countries also. In addition, there are questions of quality uh, from region to region, as well as unacceptable errors and unnecessary practices. 
and the cost of care uh, with the retirement of the baby boomers has the potential to threaten the bankruptcy of the public sectors at the uh, state and federal level of government. So this is a hugely important issue before us. Now the goals of achieving high quality care at affordable and sustainable cost, however, pose enormous challenges uh, to our nation and our healthcare system. We have a very complex public-private system, almost like no other in the world, and any change in it reverberates with many other changes, off, many of those unforeseen, and the interactions between the market and the government are somewhat unpredictable, and we're really at the beginning of this process. So we're at a great stage to see how far we've come, but we have a long way to go. Now, for us at USC Price, this is a hugely important topic. Uh, uh, health policy and management and health in general is one of our major areas for research. Uh, we have uh, one of the top uh, centers in the country through the Schaefer Center on Health Policy and Economics. And we have one of the top uh, Masters of Health Administration and Executive Masters of Health Administration programs in the country as well, as well as an undergraduate concentration in health. Uh, if you look at our school, uh, the most important, most major investment over the past few years has been in the health area, and the fastest growing area of our school today is in these areas of, of health care and, and health policy and health administration. So this is exceedingly important to us. Uh, we have numerous graduates uh, and our alumni uh, in various roles as CEO of, CEOs of uh, healthcare systems, directors and managers, and of facilities across California and really across the country. And uh, while our alumni are working very hard uh, to set policies and improve processes and enhance the quality of healthcare, uh, and make our organizations more effective and efficient, they also face these kind of uncertainties. So the school tonight is very pleased uh, to convene this important conversation about healthcare reform and implementation. And we have the privilege of hearing from some of the field's top professionals and providers who will discuss the challenges, but also the uh, opportunities uh, of this transformation that's occurring in our healthcare system. So we look forward to a truly informative and thought-provoking panel. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our panel's moderator, Kim Athman, or Kim Athman King. Uh, Kim is the founder, president, and principal consultant of Strategy Advantage, a healthcare consulting company which he founded in 2002. She is a healthcare business strategy specialist, applying her expertise and technical experience to help, help health organizations drive growth. She boasts a really accomplished career of more than 20 years uh, as a healthcare executive, uh, also at Cedar sinai uh, here in Los Angeles, and St. Agnes Medical Center in Fresno. She has also led key strategic pro uh, projects on business uh, service plans, model care development, program planning, new development, uh, new ideas development, and div uh, vision development. In addition, she is a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, and I had the privilege of attending their uh, national association meetings in uh, uh, Chicago just a month or so ago, where one of our alums was uh, honored. Uh, she's also the re recent past president of Healthcare Executives of Southern California and is currently the Southern California Regent of the American College of Healthcare Executives. She's a frequent speaker and writer on healthcare strategy, as well as business development ideas and innovation. And so I ask you to join me in giving a hearty welcome to Kim Athman King. Thank you, Dr. Knott, and um, I just have to commend you. Very few people get the middle part of my name correct, Athman King, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. 
Well, welcome everybody tonight. As uh, we've uh, been uh, told in the early introductions, uh, this is going to be a fascinating conversation. And I really like that word very much because given where we're at in healthcare these days, what a time to be in healthcare, right? What a time to be leaders in healthcare. And we are very, very honored to have some distinguished leaders uh, sitting here with us tonight. Um, and what a time for a conversation. Um, you know, the old Bob Dylan lyrics, uh, the times they are a changing. We definitely got that changing going on here in healthcare. And so whether you're a provider, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a patient, whether you're a new buyer of health insurance on the Covered California Exchange, which I am and my husband is, um, you know, whether you're a, a student or a caregiver, the fact of the matter is, as it relates to healthcare, especially now in this moment of time, we're all in this together. We're in this together. And we're going to talk tonight about um, various topics. And uh, we hope that this will kind of be a learning experience. We hope that it will be an experience that will expand your viewpoint. Um, and you know, we hope that you will walk away with kind of a different appreciation for healthcare and the challenges and the opportunities that are before us. And in particular, you, we hope that uh, you will walk away with kind of this, this uh, renewed reassurance that we've got some real fascinating things going on here in Southern California, uh, some leaders that are, um, uh, that have plans going forward that are exciting and energizing and uh, that will leave you feeling kind of rest assured that we've got our future in good stead. Right, guys? <laughs> sure. All right, so before we get started too quickly, I want to just do, cover a couple of logistics. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a panel discussion for about an hour from about 6.45 to 7.45. And during that panel discussion, we are going to be addressing four different questions or topics. Okay, so about 15 minutes per topic. Um, by about 7.45 or sooner, uh, depending upon how we proceed here, we will then have a Q&A discussion. So um, there will be plenty of time for that conversation to go on with all of you, and I will do my best as your moderator to move us to that point such that we do preserve that time for Q&A at the end. But before we get too far into this, let me introduce the, the, the panelists that are here uh, with me tonight. Um, I will tell you, first of all, we did expect one other person, Kim Belche, from um, uh, board member of Covered California and executive director with First 5 LA, but unfortunately, she uh, notified us that she is ill, so not able to join us tonight. So I apologize for that. Um, but we do have um, three very distinguished individuals representing both the provider side of healthcare and the payer side of healthcare. And I will let you know that as we go into the conversation tonight, we will talk a little bit about what does that mean to be on the provider side versus the payer side, because even that is blurring as we go through the changes that we're going through. So Dale, I think you'll discuss that a little bit later as we go, go forward. Uh, so let me start with uh, Dr. Doug Allen um, here in the middle. Um, Doug Allen is the Vice President of Integration for DeVita Healthcare Partners. Uh, he joined DeVita Healthcare Partners in April of 2013. He is accountable for integrating the Healthcare Partners national clinical, clinical organizations. In addition to 20 years of management experience, he also has five plus years of clinical practice as a board certified internist. Uh, before joining Healthcare Partners, uh, Dr. Allen uh, was the uh, Chief Medical Officer for Optum Collaborative Care, a $4.5 billion division of United and Optum, serving more than 2 million patients in 32 states. And prior to that, uh, Dr. Allen served as Vice President of Clinical Services for Caremore Health Plan. Um, I presume that most of you are familiar with Caremore, um, a combined senior health plan and IPA that has done a lot to um, really bring some new innovations to healthcare. Uh, Dr. Allen was also past Chief Medical Officer of Greater Newport uh, Physicians, uh, where he oversaw all clinical costs and quality associated with this I IPA. Um, he has many other uh, credentials, um, uh, degrees, and qualifications, but to suffice it to say that uh, Dr. Allen is going to be bringing uh, a, a vast perspective 
uh, from both the, the vantage point of being a doctor and the vantage point of a very, very large and growing medical group, but also a, a medical group that is in a position now to actually even act like a payer as they are um, a delegated medical group model here in Southern California, and as they are acting kind of like an accountable care organization in all of the marketplaces that they serve. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Douglas Allen. Also to my right is Steve Moore. He's the Senior Vice President of Finance at Loma Linda University Medical Center. Um, Steve joined the corporation of uh, Loma Linda in 1998 after five years with Ernst & Young and was instrumental in the 1999 organizational turnaround. Uh, Steve Moore was appointed Vice President of Finance in February of 2002 and Senior Vice President of Finance in December of that same year. He also serves as the CEO of the Loma Linda Healthcare Pro Properties uh, CFO of Loma Linda University Behavioral Medicine Center, um, Loma Linda Mercantile, Loma Linda Medical Enterprises, and Loma Linda Faculty Pharmacy. In addition, uh, Steve serves on the Board of Trustees for Social Action Community Health System and as treasurer for California Children's Hospital Association. So, Steve, lots of CFO titles and CEO titles. Welcome and thank you for being here today. <laughs> And then finally, uh, certainly not least, is Dale Surowitz. Uh, Dale is the Chief Operating Officer for Providence Health and Services. Uh, he is responsible for overseeing the five hospitals. Is it still five hospitals? Or six hospitals now with the new uh, St. Uh, John's facilities. Um, he's also overseeing the related boards for these different hospitals, as well as three philanthropic foundations and related boards in California. Prior to his appointment at Providence, Providence for the past 24 years, he served as the CEO for hospitals in the Los Angeles area. More recently, served as the CEO of Providence Tarzana Medical Center, where he led the hospital through the transition from a for-profit hospital to a faith-based nonprofit ministry. And prior to Providence uh, acquiring the facility from Tenet Healthcare, uh, Dale was the CEO for Encino Tarzana Regional Medical Center. So Dale, of course, is going to represent the vantage point of hospitals and uh, growing um, and very integrated delivery system um, with uh, offices uh, and facilities here in Southern California. So please join me in welcoming Dale Surowitz. Okay, so our topic tonight, as you all know, is beyond reform from val volume to value. And Dr. Knott has already kind of queued up this notion of the triple, triple aim. And we all are pretty familiar with that as well, where as we work forward in this reform world of healthcare, we're working to balance the three attributes of improving population-based health, improving quality and access, and of course, doing all of that while still sustaining uh, maintaining and ideally reducing costs. So it's a very interesting challenge that is on our plate. And as we kind of move now into our panel discussion, I want to just kind of cue up um, this notion initially about where kind of this reform movement has come from. You know, while there's a lot of attention on the Affordable Care Act right now, Obamacare, et cetera, we all know that the reform in our system has been a call to action for many, many, many years. Um, way back, if you remember, in March of 2001, and even before that, the Institute of Medicine re uh, uh, um, put out its Crossing the Quality Chasm paper. Do you all remember that? And a whole lot of the elements of that Crossing the Quality paper basically was a call to the system to reinvent for the 21st century and a lot of the principles of the triple aim were embedded in that March 2001 paper 13 years ago. So here we are now with a lot of that, a lot of that thinking now taking shape in the form of a reform initiative and uh, a whole lot of this uh, requirement now for healthcare providers to what I would call pivot in new directions. 
and we are all pivoting in many new directions. Uh, the question of strategy and how you reinvent, how to reform, et cetera, is on everyone's, everyone's minds. And there's a whole lot of activity in boardrooms, um, in you know, operational centers, et cetera, making that change happen. So the first question that we want to put forth for the panelists uh, tonight relates to this moving in this new, uh, new direction. And I'd like to ask Doug Allen to start with this question. Specifically, how are we addressing challenges in achieving more of a population health orientation, especially in lieu of the infrastructure gaps that are very real and alive? Um, in our communities and in our healthcare delivery systems? Um, is there a strong incentive for health systems to really get serious about population health? Is there enough of that incentive to drive forward the kind of change that needs to be driven forward? And as you ask the question about pivoting in this new direction, can you comment on who you think in Southern California is doing a, a particularly good job you know, preparing for this population health delivery of health care? That's a lot of questions. Yes. <laughs> well, How about you, easy? Steve? Yeah. Um, no one said it's going to be easy. <laughs> yeah. How are we doing? Um, uh, managing populations these days is all about legislated and regulated products, right? So and every one of them poses its own challenges and opportunities. So you have the seniors only, and you have Medicare fee-for-service, which is a different product than the Medicare Advantage, which is a different product than chronic special needs plans, and all those have different <coughs> tactics. And then you have accountable care organizations, which is fee-for-service medicine, and they're trying to layer something on top of that um, to manage costs and quality. Um, and then you have the duals, meaning Medicaid and Medicare eligible patients, and now you bring nursing home costs into their so, um, and hospice and end of life is gonna come into the regular Medicare Advantage line. So, every one of those sprouts businesses that try to respond to them. And I would say that there are adequate financial incentives depending on the state, because I'm, I'm looking at it from a, kind of a national perspective and Southern California is pretty unique. Uh, what, so, so that's very difficult and it'll continue to go through modifications to, to try to give organizations a better chance, a fighting chance, and improving quality and, and, and costs. So um, are we pivoting in the new direction? I've, every one of, I've been involved in so many organizations that have attacked so many of those product lines, and I've seen just phenomenal innovation. Some, some st stuff and people I'm just really proud of along the way. Uh, so I, with all this kind of chaos, this challenge, I think I'm Pollyannish in the long term because I'm seeing uh, recurrent tool development. And, by, and what do I mean by that? So, the dual special needs plans is an example where you bring nursing homes in. Well, medical groups are, have never tried to keep people at home and stop them from making the decision to go into a nursing home. That's never been a core competence, and it's not a medical issue. It's a social issue. You can handle it at home, or you can handle it in a nursing home. So, so tooling up to that uh, and getting ready for that, and the PACE programs have been a good example of attacking that and trying to model our tactics and tools after the PACE program is something I've seen a lot of early work just started because it's a kind of a brand new challenge. Accountable care organizations uh, trying to stop people from going to the lowest quality, highest cost provider, which they're allowed to do and having a super high number of physicians and facilities to choose from. So yeah, I think we're, I'm, I'm Pollyannish that the tools that we're developing can be reused and modified over time and will form, you'll use them in different ways for different markets because healthcare is very local. Phoenix, where I'm kind of stationed right now, is very different than Southern California. So you use them in different ways, but the fundamental building block, the tools are uh, are definitely being developed out there, and it's exciting. Um, yeah, the, one at the end, oh, who's doing the best job? Healthcare partners, right? Oh. <laughs> so I'm working for them. They pay my. Why? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Okay. Um, you know, healthcare partners is going through a lot of changes now. They they were Southern California based. They bought something in Florida and. And uh, in Vegas, but then uh, now they're in five, six, eight, six states now, um, and and they're developing the the machinery to go to the next level to be a much more rigorous about um, uh, metrics and about IT. And I can't tell you the amount of activity that's occurring right now to to take it from you know I think most medical groups I apologize to medical groups out there, but we were kind of like mom and pop shops, right? We had. Uh, some of them, they're very large, but they're still kind of run internally like a patriarchal or 
whatever kind of uh, enterprise, and now they're turning into really formal machines to try to tackle some really tough problems. And, and they're bringing up, Healthcare Partners was purchased by DaVita, and so now we're a public company. With public company comes a level of rigor that didn't exist before, good, all good, uh, and some public capital that we can infuse into, this, into these machines and different IT tools and all that to expand. And it's really exciting on the inside right now. So is that good answers to why it's the best? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that'll suffice. So, okay. you know, as uh, Dale, you take this next, um, maybe start by talking about what does it mean to become a population health provider? And then speak to kind of the challenges at Providence as it relates to your ramping up and or delivering in more of that context. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, you know, it's very interesting because when you talk about success measures, it's, it's very nebulous what a success measure is today. Because you have organizations that we view as incredibly successful because of their innovation and they're losing all kinds of money. So the question we have to ask ourselves really is what is the success measure, both in terms of, you hear the expression, one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat. What's the success measure right now? And really, there is no real good success measure as you plan for the future and you still have to address the current issue of taking care of patients today and being able to make sure that you can take care of them financially successfully for yourself. So one of the things that uh, organizations and Providence is one had to look at is how do we be able, how are we able to morph into the future? What is the future going to look like? We've looked at it uh, to say, well, we've got to establish a clinically integrated network. We've got to have an integrated delivery system. And the interesting part about doing that is it's not cheap. Those of you that are involved in it in any significant way know this is a very expensive proposition. Most, just to give you some bit of numbers, you look at organizations around the country, when you do this, you lose anywhere between $150,000 to $200,000 per physician per year on the group side, and you expect to make that up on the hospital side. So to engage in this is a very costly proposition. So the question you have to ask yourself, you just hope you're there, we're still working at the end of the day when you're done because your organization may not financially be able to sustain it. So the or you really have to balance, and I think the whole purpose, and I, and I look at it in today's world now, it's all about balance. It's about balancing your current needs for where you expect yourself to go in the future. So we've looked at it by how do we grow? Well, we've developed an uh, integrated delivery network where we have a physician component. So we acquired FACI Medical Group. We have Providence Medical, Medical Institute and Providence Medical Group, Axminster Medical Group, Affiliates Medical Group, and so you have this agglomeration of medical groups that have come on board. And what you end up with is now we have 375 physicians, 380,000 lives under our umbrella. So you're now in the medical group business. You're in the hospital business. But yet, as we move to the future, is that enough? Is that enough to be able to sustain yourself in a, in a market here in Los Angeles Whereas you look at narrow networks, you look at product, you know, organizations, let's say like Boeing, who are now, or even Microsoft or other large organizations who in different parts of the country are saying, here, we're giving it to you. You take care of our 100,000 lives. So are we in a position to effectively do that in Los Angeles? And I would hazard to say that unless you're Kaiser right now, probably no one's there. And if you look at a success measure, really at this point in time, most organizations are still, I'm be very candid, are playing catch up to Kaiser. <laughs> And as you look at that model, more organizations are trying to look at that as the place they want to go to, okay? And if you can't create it on your own where you're buying all of these entities up and then you have to worry about the post-acute continuum as well and be able to address that. And then of course the other issue is, do you accept risk and then you have to have a, Knox -Keen, a limited Knox Keen to take that on board? And then do you evolve into, well, do you need to ultimately have a full Knox Keen? But to be able to do this, you really can't do it effectively on your own. So you're seeing dialogue happening. And now it's a very interesting situation happening now where you have competitors talking to each other. You're basically saying, how do we collaborate? And we agree to collaborate and be partners in one area, but we're gonna compete in another. So we're your partner in some places, but we're your competitor in others. And that's what's happening now all over, not just in Los Angeles, all over the nation. These kinds of dialogues are occurring. And we're having that with other medical groups, we're having that with insurance companies, and we're having that with other hospital providers. So we're, it, there's a significant change that is afoot, that something we've never seen before, where you're actually having a competitor 
and a collaborator all in the same organization. So uh, we're going through fundamental change and as you morph into a population health company, that, mo that morphing is you have to be able to all, as you look at it in the long run, figure out a way to be able to accept risk, manage risk, and still come out somehow ahead of the game in the long run. So it's a very challenging environment, very exciting, but it's not, fraught, it's not for the faint of heart. So, and I have to ask, thank you, Dale. Um, so, Steve, from your vantage point, you were with Loma Linda University Medical Center, and more of an academic, tertiary type of <laughs> medical center environment. So, where does your pivoting kind of conversation go from your vantage point when you also have research miss missions, teaching missions, et cetera, and probably an array of patients in your organization that might be more tertiary in nature? Um, are you also moving in the direction of being largely a population health manager, or is there a different strategy that is out there to, con to consider as you think about your future? You know, um, Loma Linda University Medical Center is comprised of six hospitals in very diverse areas. Um, our primary university hospital is next to San Bernardino, one of the areas with the highest unemployment in the nation. We've got a facility in Murrieta, which is, has the best demographics of the whole Riverside San Bernardino County region. And as we are um, members of the community within that very demographic region, um, we have felt strongly that it is important to develop really a health network to be able to provide care across the continuum, much as what others are doing in their markets as well. For us, it is a little bit more unique as we have a children's hospital. We do a lot of tertiary coronary care. And so we have many of what are, were our previous prior competitors, as Dale was mentioning, coming and talking to us about how can we collaborate? How can we start working together? Additionally, we have a scenario where we have about 800 faculty practice plan physicians, which is beautiful in many ways, but they're also very specialty and subspecialty focused. So we have significant gaps on the primary care side of things. And so as we look to collaborate, to partner, to affiliate in our market, um, it, it's become a very great opportunity for us to move towards the idea of population health management. I think as you introduced um, uh, me, you mentioned a turnaround for our organization back in the 90s. Um, in the late 90s, we, like most other organizations, had a significant number of capitated lives and we were full risk over a wide geographic area. Unfortunately for us, we weren't able to manage that risk. As we're moving now more towards population health management, we believe we're wiser and smarter about how we can manage that risk. Looking to work with other partners that can provide the acute care services that we can't do in an economic fashion. Looking to other physician partners that can provide the primary care that we have not invested in over the past decades. And so that gives us, again, that great opportunity one of the other pieces that we're really looking at, particularly with our um, School of Public Health, is the idea of what really causes additional utilization of healthcare services. And if you look specifically at the policy issues around poverty, particularly as, again, we're in the San Bernardino Basin, you see that individuals who tend to be out of work tend to um, see more alcoholism in their families, tend to smoke more often, tend to um, have a higher mortality. tend to have higher mortality, excuse me. And as such, we have to look at ways that we can try and manage that, again, from a public policy standpoint, and how can a healthcare provider, uh, affiliated obviously with a university, move forward with helping our community thrive in ways that not only helps uh, reduce um, uh, the economic issues, uh, enhancing um, employment in the area, but also as we look at how does that then relate to being able to manage that population and their health in a more effective fashion. One of the things we're additionally doing is, I think you also mentioned our involvement with social action community health centers. We're building a 150,000 square foot medical office building that is a hub for a federally qualified health center. As such, we believe that that's going to bring jobs into San Bernardino, because specifically in downtown San Bernardino, a very underserved and impacted area. 
We believe that it also will bring needed health care in a fashion that is appropriately compensated for those providing the care within that community as well. So again, not to go too f much further because I could probably talk all evening on the issue, but at the same time, those are some of the strategies that we're at least starting to really employ and starting to move out into the market. Great, okay, good. So you've gotten just a bit of an overview regarding the general you know, uh, uh, structural changes that various of these organizations are pursuing. And as Dale mentioned, a lot of capital cost, a lot of you know reinvention inside of these organizations, a lot of blurring of the lines, if I can use some a word that Dr. Allen spoke about when we uh, prepared for this. You know, you've got now hospitals who are now partnered with the medical groups. You've got hospitals and medical groups that are now choosing to potentially become health plans and or apply for their Knox Keen license such that they can act like a health plan, et cetera. And there's probably much more blurring of the lines as it relates to this notion of we're consolidating, we're competing, we're collaborating, we're coordinating, et cetera. A good CEO friend of mine said something like, yes, we are all we're all dating each other's girlfriends like we were in high yeah. school. <laughs> and we're all kind of cheating on each other too, he said. You know, so it's an interesting time in healthcare. Um, so on, you know, in the context of this, what is the, what is the role of the, the payer and the provider these days? Can you speak, can you all speak to a little bit of this changing role of the provider becoming the payer, the payer becoming the provider, the doctors becoming the CEOs of the hospital, et cetera. And you know, what's likely to occur as we continue to blur these lines? And is it better that payers become providers or that providers become payers as we think about serving our communities? You, anybody, Dale, anytime. go ahead and start. Okay. You know, I, I don't think one is better than the next. You know, it's, it's not about who does it, it's how you do it. And I think as we look at this, we have a responsibility. You know, as Providence, we're a mission-based organization, so we need to make sure we are providing care to the poor and the vulnerable, but we're providing that level of service and care. That has to be paramount. So all of us need to say, how do we provide that level of care? What are we doing to make sure we're delivering the highest quality of care possible? challenge, there's just less dollars in there. There's just less dollars that we know are going to be available. So how do we manage that and how do we function? And we're all kind of trying to find our way through this process. So everyone's taking on new roles that they may not have had before. And these, as we talk about clinically integrated networks, everybody's trying to, to morph, as again, into those kinds of things and create them. And I think there's going to be those challenges that are going to continue to occur. But we have to remember a couple of things. Even in the British systems, you know, one third of the population is still outside the queue in the British system. We still have the vast majority of our physicians that are on our medical staffs. And in, in Providence, we have 5,000 physicians that are on our staffs. Those 5,000 physicians, the vast majority of them are in private practice. They're wondering, how do I get through all of this? And where am I going to land? And how am I going to land? And where are my structures? So we have to think about how do we create structures for them to be able to change and, and be able to move into a new environment. So I think we're in this situation right now where we're, everyone is trying, in many cases, I shouldn't say everyone, but certainly hospital organizations, we're trying to be all things to all people right now because we're still caring for in the old mechanism, the old traditional standard processes for how we deliver care and how we're paid for care. On the other hand, we're looking to the, to the future. So. I think the issue is it's going to be about those organizations that can create balance to make sure that we're delivering on the triple aim, to make sure we're delivering high qualities of service, delivering quality, and we're also doing it effectively and as affordably as we can. And so again, I don't think there is a, a favored mode to do it, but I also want to stress I don't think those, as an organization as we look forward, we're going to be able to do it singularly. We're going to have to partner with other organizations and do things collectively because again, we, can't, we don't do all things. And we're gonna have to look at those levels of partnerships with organizations that are gonna be able to help us provide a continuum of care to meet the needs of our population. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah totally agree. I, um, and there will always be a role for payers. Um, 
I think, um, and then they're the aggregators. And I think um, the, uh, people tend to underestimate what goes into a health plan. I've been on both sides, so um, yeah, just, just the actuaries and the benefit creations and interacting with the federal government and the employers and that type of thing, is it's pretty complicated. But I think right now is the time of providers, and I mean, um, I mean that with the hospitals and medical groups trying to come together and work through this. Um, because the care model and how we, how we improve the triple aim, it has just, it's just in its infancy. And with these numerous products, um, have taken a product view, it's really critical we collaborate. And you see that healthcare partners is working with five hospital systems right now, trying to get a different relationship going. Um, and uh, even in Phoenix, we're trying to do that. So, uh, and then you have IT companies coming in, you have vend the, the whole vendor thing we haven't really talked about, but vendors can come in and help fill some of the gaps too. But I, I'm a, at this point, I'm a fan of the first providers coming together and retooling the care model and doing the, from the inpatient to the post-acute, making sure they don't get readmitted, chronic disease management, keeping people out of nursing homes, et cetera, and then facing all those challenges, and then working with, uh, with uh, numerous payers instead of becoming payers. Go ahead. Yeah, I would say in the case of Loma Linda University Medical Center as well, uh, we're really looking to partner with the payers as opposed to becoming a payer. Uh, we think that if we were to really um, get a full NOx scheme license, start to compete directly, that we would be in a situation of um, providing a certain amount of irrational competition where we can closely partner with the payers and hopefully have success. As we focus on what we do best, they can focus on what they do best, assuming that you have a true partnership. Okay. You know, we, there's also um, a lot of movement we know toward consolidation in almost kind of a hyperactive way. Um, in most market areas across the country, there is consolidation to the point where there's maybe five, six, seven, you know, four, three health systems that pretty much serve the marketplace. In, Cal in Southern California, we still tend to be fairly fragmented, but this hyper-consolidation is very much underway now. So can you speak to that? And number one, you know, what are the pros and cons of consolidation, both from the vantage point of the hospitals and health systems, but also from the vantage point of the people, the patients. And, you know, is there a place wherever a Providence and a healthcare partners might consolidate? Or I mean, what would be the craziest kind of proposition regarding consolidation? And how many health systems do we think we're going to finish with as this continues? You know, I. I, you know, I used to be used to talk about this and say that'll never happen. Right. Like you can't say that anymore. This it may happen. Things may happen. Um, you know what we're what we're starting to see, and, and it's it's funny. So Facey is our, one of our medical groups, and Facey was very very proud of the fact they thought they saw a 25 percent reduction in their inpatient utilization this past year on the same set of volumes. And some of the folks that we have from Holy Cross are like, they're crying and Facey is cheering. Yep. And so my point is, is that we're going to see less inpatient utilization. And as a hospital CEO for many years, you know, we used to view ourselves as kind of like the epicenter of the universe. And the reality of it is, we're no, it's, more, it's no longer going to be the epicenter of the universe. We're changing, the, net, the system is becoming that. So I think the the evolution of how care is delivered is creating these changes. And the changes in reimbursement structures are creating these changes because you can't survive moving forward unless you look at it. So you've got an integration of clinical activity and financial activity all coming together. And you're trying to figure out how do we best serve our, our population. So I, I see consolidation um, for the most part as going to be a necessary component to be able to deliver care moving forward. Again, it's an own it. Do we partner for it? Do we collectively buy it together? Do we create our own? And everybody, again, is still finding their way. We viewed it that there is no one model necessarily that we need to look at. But we feel that if we don't do something, and I know that there are a lot of hospitals kind of trying to say, well, let's go in a certain direction, and the mark, kind of the train's leaving the station, and it's getting farther and farther away. So you, you've heard the, 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 the stories about the fact of how do independent freestanding hospitals survive moving in the future in major metropolitan areas. 
Well, right now, depending on your hospital, you could still do fairly well. You're not forced into it, so to speak. There are hospitals that are feeling that. So the issue really is where are you viewing where things are going? And as long as you can survive, we've got hospitals that have almost all private business and are almost seeing the whole market change, but they're the whole of the donut. They're not changing. So I think a lot of it's going to depend upon where you are in your markets, what you're doing, how do you structure yourselves for the future, do you partner to be able to do that, do you think you have to drive the process, but I would say that if you're not positioning yourself to be on that train, do, going down that track, you're going to see the market pass you by and you're no longer going to be driving the process, you're going to be trailing the process and trying to figure out how do I survive moving forward when this whole thing really does change. And we're, we haven't even seen the major shift. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. When covered California or these, not just the public exchanges, but when we see a proliferation of private exchanges, or again, employers going out there and saying, we're going to take all of our patients, all of our employees, and all of our beneficiaries, and we're going to pull them all together, and we're going to give it to the, the, the bidder who can care for our patients, our employees the best, that's when you're going to start to see fundamental changes occurring. Are we, are we kind of lining up here? Is it in the same order? Um, I don't want to steal your thunder, Steve. No, please. <laughs> the, um, yeah, the, the, you got to look at one of the underlying drivers of change, I think, of, of the consolidation. And I think one of, one of the reasons is that you have an insolvent organization, so it just gets sold. And uh, that, of course, will always happen periodically. Two, uh, and I don't like this, but it's the defensive. It's the it's purely for defense. So they're not they're not merging, consolidating because they're improving the value of healthcare. They're improving to try to maintain relevancy given the changes. So, and the third, which I like the most, is they just re there is just a realization that you can do it better together. Um, the defensive. I just the underlying premise there is in in compared to our fee for service or, uh, or just volume driven system. When we go to fee for value, the, we won't need as many hospital beds. And we won't need as many specialists, and which means there will be winners and there will be losers. And I think that kind of drives the defensive tactics. But um, with the whole need for um, improving integration and uh, making sure medications don't get dropped when they go home, you have an inpatient, you have an outpatient event. And having the folks on the inpatient, the facilities cooperate and collaborate with us just is proving to be more and more valuable. Uh, and, and certainly healthcare partners recommend, recognizes that. And it, uh, so, yeah, I think there's going to be more of it, and I agree. I think some of the stuff that comes down the pike, I think, is going to really surprise people. And I don't even know what those things are, but I, I, my last job was with a, a services division of United Health, the largest healthcare organization in the world. And here they enter into the provider space. And with all that capital, you know, they were very large very quickly. Um, so, so who would have thought that a payer would go buy a bunch of medical groups and, 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 a, and also a post-acute model. We had a thousand nurse practitioners in the field seeing patients in 30 states and all that. So just these bizarre combinations. And some of them just don't work and won't work uh, because of the execution, like, as you said. I mean, it, it's the way they did it. It didn't, didn't work out. And some that didn't, don't, you know, you might wonder why a DaVita dialysis company buys a, a provider group. Some of you have probably been scratching your heads on that. So. <laughs> Um, it works because of the culture and some other reasons, but so some things that don't make sense really work in the end because of the way they do it, and some things that make perfect sense just don't work at all for the same reason. Well, one of the things that Dale mentioned was the idea that um, if you're sort of not on the bus, you're going to get passed by. I think I probably butchered what you said, but at least I guess to the point. <laughs> um, and what we're seeing in our market is that many of the organizations, uh, many of the hospitals specifically, are saying, you know what? Um, we're concerned about being narrow networked, about being commoditized, and we're seeing that at Loma Linda as well. We're not going to be the lowest cost provider because we do teaching, we do the research components, and we have a significant um, uh, level of cost relating to the tertiary coronary services that we're providing. And so as we see patients going around us because the payers are forcing them to or otherwise, um, we're obviously um, concerned about, again, being commoditized. Um, we, as we also were talking, you know, um, there's a lot of discussion going on. Um, as most people here, um, everybody's talking to everybody. We currently have seven NDAs signed with hospitals in Riverside and San Bernardino County. Uh, we have three um, significant uh, uh, physician uh, networks that we're talking to as well. And we're looking at how can we pull that all together 
um, how can we really work together in a meaningful way? And it seems as though each of us who are talking has the need for something different. We don't want to be commoditized um, and uh, lose the ability to do the um, bread and butter work. Um, other organizations may need capital. Other ones are just looking for a population health strategy. They see that coming and they say, how do I get on board with an organization that we can work together to build a population health strategy? And how can we work together to make that effective within the community? And so um, realistically, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of consolidation in the market. Um, it brings, obviously, the opportunity to have scale. Uh, to be able to really look again across the larger continuum of care and really standardize the way that patients are being cared for. The ability to share data amongst organizations who might be on Cerner or Epic or something else. Um, and that in itself is another way to help ensure that you're taking care of those patients in a meaningful fashion to reduce uh, redundancy of testing, reduce overall costs, et cetera. And that really can then provide a true value to the payers, as well as obviously to the patients in terms of the quality care that they're being provided, hopefully close to home. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about um, the consolidation, clinical integrated networks, coordinated care, and all of these elements that are part of this process toward reform. Um, that are all efforts to really create more of a population health infrastructure. And, you know, obviously the, the hope is that the net effect of all of this is that the individuals, the patients we serve, et cetera, will feel like they're having, they're getting more of this popula population health orientation to the care. And obviously the, the real test is whether we're changing the outcomes at the end of the day. Um, one of those outcomes is quality, but the other outcome is cost. So, you know, each year that we see, you know, the new, the latest health affairs kind of out, uh, uh, report regarding where costs have kind of gone, we see that percent of GDP continuing to kind of, uh, you know, crank up and up and up. And currently it's at about 18%. According to a New York Times article just yesterday, um, they were challenging the notion that it's expected that our cost will continue to go up 1.2 percentage points above the cost of inflation for the next 20 years. So, you know, the question is, are we bending the cost curve? Um, can we bend the cost curve? And in fact, in this New York Times article, um, someone was quoted to say, we have been consistently bending the cost curve over the last 20 years. Remember managed care, capitation, and all of those incentives at that point that encouraged us to do that. But this person says, history shows that the kinds of things that we do don't tend to be permanent. So the challenge for us is really this question, are we really better together as we consolidate, as we chase after scale, as we kind of presume kind of this integration will create economies of scale? What are, you know, can you speak to kind of convincing the group here that the activities that we are taking on as healthcare providers are in fact bending that cost curve, will continue to permanently bend the cost curve such that this whole experiment of ours has some real potential for working over the longer term? I'll let somebody else. Steve, start let's start there, with you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go back the other direction. Yeah. Um, one of the key things is ensuring that there are aligned incentives. Um, there are a number of key components. But one of the things that we've seen recently is um, that initially when the opportunity came up to be part of the bundled payment, um, uh, bundled payment process with Medicare, Loma Linda didn't participate in that. Uh, the window opened again more recently and we decided, you know, we're going to try and be part of that and we're closely looking at um, the idea of doing that for cardiovascular services and for ortho services. And what it's really done is opened up a really significant dialogue with our physicians, with our faculty practice plan docs that you think, you know, we're pretty close to each other, why don't you guys have that dialogue before? But the incentives aren't necessarily aligned as they are under bundled payment where you can actually have legalized gain sharing. And so we have our head of cardiology and our head of orthopedics coming to us and saying, how can we work together? How can we do reprocessing now that they didn't want to do uh, uh, 
previously. How can we look at utilizing um, uh, direct from the manufacturer implantables as opposed to going through marketing companies, et cetera? How can we work on getting patients out of the hospital earlier? How can we uh, reduce the length of stay in a sniff? And so it's really been exciting to see the physicians come to the table and be excited about the ideas of how can we work together. And a lot of that, again, comes back to aligning those incentives. In terms of the abilities to really cut cost, you know, we're doing what everybody else out there is probably doing, and we're trying to negotiate better contracts. We're trying to leverage, obviously, off of our GPO and of our, out of our local contracts. We're looking to standardize utilization of certain types of um, supplies and pharmaceuticals. That'll get you only so far. And again, as I think we all know, the big issue is providing quality care that is reducing utilization. And um, personal experience, my father broke his ankle about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, ended up in the hospital, had some surgery, and embarrassingly enough, got C. diff in my hospital. <laughs> but what it really highlighted was he ended up there an extra five days that he didn't need to be there. The cost of his care was significantly higher. And so for me, as a finance guy, it, I go back and say, wow, you know, we really need to change that. We need to go back and invest more in quality, invest more in what we're doing to try and reduce hospital-acquired infections, reduce um, the waste that we're seeing in a number of other areas, et cetera. We have great opportunities there. We talked a little bit earlier about the idea of having a standardized medical record across not just one single organization, but across a network. You know, previously, when we worked with one of our um, affiliated organizations, Beaver Medical Group, uh, they might send patients to our physicians for a higher level of care, and we end up having to redo a CT scan, redo an MRI, redo labs, because there's not shared information between the organizations. They're on a different sy system platform. And if we can get on the same platform, which we're talking about now, or figure out some sort of a f uh, floor way to share that data, we can reduce um, having to do those um, advanced imaging scans or draw that blood again from the patient. And again, going back to not just cutting cost, but improving the quality of the service we're providing those patients. So I think that it's very doable. We just have to make sure that the incentives are aligned and that we're really working together, again, surrounding the patient as we work towards higher quality and that brings about the lower cost as well. Good. So what you're talking about are some, so the constancy of that uh, aligned incentives, very important to continue as we then even um, uh, marry that up with the way in which payment then occurs, right? Um, but also then you've shared some examples of some, what sound to be some pretty transformative changes that should have a lasting effect. So Dr. Allen, speak to us uh, more about that. Where else are we going to be seeing some real significant bending of the cost curve? Um, yeah, I, I, um, I see examples of this every day at the micro level. So at the state level for our medical group or, or uh, hospital hospitalization rates or whatever for certain region in Southern California. So I see those are necessary steps. I think we're building the tools that we'll eventually use when things get better, when they get more aligned, et cetera. So I see examples there. Um, it, but really, bending the cost curve at the nation is going to require that the, the national payer system incentivize the right behaviors. Now, right now, you're, trying, you're seeing organizations come together, hospitals, medical groups, underneath some umbrellas that exist today, managed care pockets in certain states, et cetera. And so they're even combining together and becoming more efficient. But until the top, you know, the, the, the financial system in the nation gets, uh, gets the right incentives in place, we can't, we can't use all those tools to bend the national cost. But we'll then be ready. I think we're building the tools every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Doug, or excuse me, Dale. You know, I look at, um, at what we've, when you look at certain, um, certain specialties or certain areas, if you involve the physicians, and I think it's almost across the board, the greatest opportunity that I see for us to, to look at changing how we provide care and doing it cost effectively, cost affordably, and deliver high, and high outcomes and reliable outcomes 
is you gotta change those incentives as we've heard. But it's, a, it's amazing, we, we created an entity called, it's called Providence Partners for Health. We modeled it after Advocates Health System and Memorial Hermann, mm -hmm. who created a clinical integration model. We've got 900 physicians in it now and it's growing. A Couple of physicians came, to, actually we brought six orthopedists representing our hospitals together. And we noticed some very innovative things when you take a look at the data. How come one physician had significantly lower cost structures, significantly less length of stay, and that same physician had the best outcomes. How is that? Just so happened that physician had a completely different, most of his practice was a capitated model. And so he was not paid on a fee-for-service model for most of his work. So when we looked at those kinds of things, you could see, you know, you change how people, what their motivations are, you're going to change their behavior, and you're gonna change the outcomes that you can get if you have the right if you, let's say if you have the right carrots, you're gonna get the necessary result. We just haven't really in the United States have always the right carrots. And it's an, it's an interesting argument and a dialogue that you have in physicians, uh, in do doctors' dining rooms all the time about the fact of how, you know, the private doctors who are saying keep the same models and the other doctors who are saying no, if we change, there's opportunity. And I really believe if you, physicians, were the best and the brightest that you always had in your classes in school. Those, those, doc, those people became physicians. You work with your physicians and we coordinate these things across the country. We will come up with more cost effective, more affordable models that we're, will be able to demonstrate outstanding outcomes. I really believe that. And it's not just in terms of what happens in clinical activity in the hospital. You change those structures, you're gonna see better performance all the way around. We saw uh, organizations, and there's a, all over Los Angeles, but I'm working with one organization, another hospital organization does a lot of tertiary work. They went from one of the worst results in the country on readmission rates to some of the top reimburse, uh, re uh, readmission, lower readmission rates. And what did they do? Between hiring nurse navigators, coordinated programs through home health, uh, increased the visits to high risk populations they were able to see a tremendous reduction in readmissions. And so they put together a whole structure around it. My point is, if we focus our attention in healthcare around those kinds of things that will help to achieve those objectives, we will get there. But you can talk about bundle payments and you can talk about demonstration projects, but you fundamentally have to change, as Dr. Allen said, you have to change how people are being reimbursed. And if you fundamentally change that, I think you're gonna see tremendous savings. We just haven't taken that next step to really see a tremendous change in the reimbursement structures. Yeah, very interesting commentary. And you know, it, it, yeah. it's, go ahead. One yes. Thing out of that. So this is um, that, that great that the hospitals getting involved in the space outside the hospital to avoid readmissions came from a financial incentive, mainly on the Medicare side, right? So mm -hmm. they said if, if they get readmitted, you don't get any extra money for the extra, re extra admission. And all of a sudden, you fueled tremendous innovation. Mm -hmm. as the hospital, And it also has fueled um, the hospitals getting into the ambulatory space, which has fueled some other innovation. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of just one small tweak, and everybody follows that carrot. Uh, we just need a little, we need a broader scope of these tweaks instead of just tweaking a little bit here in one product and a little here in another one. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, I just want to. No, I think a very, very interesting added comment. You know, the question <laughs> is what does come first? You know, the carrot or the stick, right? So, you know, do you innovate first? Um, and where's the incentive and the motivation to do that? Or do you wait for the payment to come first and then you deliver or you develop the delivery system around that? So perfect example is telehealth, right? So we know that for years and years and years, there's technology and increasingly a patient responsiveness to you know, preferring telehealth and email and these different types of modes of interacting with their doctors, but the payment systems haven't really been there to support them, perhaps with the exception of that being in place in rural healthcare environments. Um, there's, there are the, there's nurse practitioners and different kind of uh, levels and license levels of providing care, but the payment doesn't necessarily follow with that I either. So how far are we willing to kind of push that envelope forward in, in terms of really making, you know, uh, a transformative effect come, uh, come about? Any comments on where you might be pushing some of those innovations forward? I think more, when you look at some of the innovations, you, you, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about really is what's the role of the patient? And from my perspective, what's the patient's responsibility? 
And if you look at most of the problems we have in the United States, a lot of those, yes, you have hereditary issues, but smoking, drug abuse, overeating, almost everything comes through the mouth. It's amazing. But, it's, uh, <laughs> you know. but the interesting part to me is, is that more of the things that are patient-focused, patients taking greater control of their care, and in some instances, greater responsibility both in financial and in a, in a risk setting. So if you look at all of these interesting innovations, Providence actually has a person that's been brought on board from Amazon. Okay, they hired a senior vice president of innovation. Because when we look at things in healthcare, we tend to do things traditionally. Mm -hmm. You have to go outside of healthcare to look at things that have been kind of groundbreaking and innovative. And if you look at what Amazon has done, it's been pretty innovative where they started versus where they are today. I mean, you know, it's pretty incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that, his focus is not just the telehealth, but what is the responsibility that the patient can control? Whether that's, you know, heat-censored results that will show up on your skin and record whether you're, see you know, you're seeing changes that are happening and you take control. Dealing with a company just yesterday, which is a, a company that has these kinds of wristbands, like a Fitbit that goes in there around a wrist, let's say, or a, um, a fuel band, and that fuel band will is hooked up to a computer, and if their results, if they hit a certain level where their, you know, whether their blood pressure hits X, they immediately get a call to say, "What are you doing?" Someone is monitoring them. So there's more of those kinds of active steps or passive steps, but it's all related to the patient's role and what are they doing to, to change. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot more innovation. There has to be not just the desire to do it, but there has to be some responsibility and somebody kind of pushing that envelope, and whether that's patients taking greater control of their own, if you have more out-of-pocket payments, or Frankly, if it's an issue where you're at risk, you're going to make sure that you're managing those patients well. And I think Kaiser's a good example. You know, I'm not saying that it's altruism. It's, it's not saying it's not out of altruism, but when you're at risk, you're going to do more innovative steps to make sure the patients are healthier. Yeah. So what do you guys think? Uh, you like this whole notion of self-monitoring Fitbits and you've got to, I, you want to ask a question? <laughs> In just a bit, but you can ask one right now if you'd like. I might. Um, so uh, it, this was one where Caremore just really excelled. I, I loved the model. Um, we had uh, Robin, the social worker, <laughs> going out to the, she, she spearheaded it. We in a sense bought, brought a lot of other social workers on board, but it was our firm belief, and we saw it anecdotally. I'm not sure we ever measured it, but the, the non-medical issues generated medical costs. So I'd love to say it's altruism, but frankly, we were just under risk. So. Uh, but we, w their financial position in the house, uh, so we would come, their, their living condition, so we would come to, LA was one of our markets, and uh, so we'd have uh, grandma and her grandson who was using the house as a crack house. That was a not uncommon story, and so that's, that was my issue, that was my problem. Um, so we, we would take that person and move them into a skilled nursing facility because we could, and get them Medicaid applications so then they could go to a nursing home and we'd create a bridge. That's one example. Meals on Wheels transportation. We put benefits in place to address them. We sometimes skirted the benefits a little bit. Regulators are, you know, don't pay no attention to that comment. But we did whatever we could to, to try to address those social needs. Uh, and it was part of why we were so efficient. But I, I think that by and large, having any major investment, minor investments, not a problem, but major investments that are out ahead of financial incentives are relatively rare. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a major innovation like that, you can usually, if you pry a little bit, you'll see where the underlying carrot is. Uh, and it's the first curve, second curve problem. First curve being you know, fee for volume and the second curve being fee for service. And 
and you're not going to find hospitals um, that are getting out too far ahead of that. I, uh, I, Banner, Banner is doing a pretty good job in Phoenix. Uh, they've, they've really drank the Kool-Aid about population health and they're trying to get out. But you still see that little bit of hesitation before they commit large dollars right. in the population health until their census starts to be the majority risk-based. I think the other issue around your question is, you know, we, we, as an example, work with other organizations, whether that be the Uni Health Foundation, the Weingart Foundation, and create these kinds of partnerships with other local organizations. We try to identify organizations that have innovations, whether that's vans that go out to home, you know, to go out to the community and people who don't come in for care. Or, you know, we've got respite housing set up in different areas and kind of innovative programs for the homeless. But I think a lot of those things are, are the challenge is it requires a lot of work. It's not easy to do these things. You know, they're not just out there where people are saying, hey, we've got these programs. You have to craft them within your communities. And the challenge is we it would help if, you know, I think if, if there were more community partnerships that were brought together with organizations like organizations coming together and saying, how do we service the needs of our community better, it will at least help and get there. And again, it, unfortunately, right now, it still requires uh, grants and other organizations to help fund it, okay? Because the risk really isn't there. Some are, we, we will go out there because, again, we, it's the part of our mission and we look at, you know, community benefit-related issues because we have to. But on the other hand, if the right thing to do is to be able to do these kinds of partnerships and those dialogues should be happening in communities and, and hopefully coordination with outside funding sources to make it happen. Um, let's wait. Let's just con con continue a little bit. I was just going to comment on, you know, this is a very big, very big part of this question of population health, right? And, you know, so I guess the point here is that, um, you know, our administrators these days, as it relates to health care, are not necessarily only kind of being trained up and accountable for running a hospital business any longer. I mean, certainly not. The whole business model has changed. And when we're taking on questions like these that kind of really take into consideration the entire realm of community-based services and resources to fundamentally kind of manage that risk equation, that's a very, very different type of leadership equation. Um, on my way here, I was listening to an NPR story that talked about LA County's paramedics, um, the emergency medicine, um, uh, you know, paramedics out in the field, and they talked about the number of visits um, uh, that they they require. And the long uh, 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 and short of this is that they spoke about 20 people um, having 14, accounting for 1,400 of these emergency pickups, you know, so therein lies a little bit of the way in which we have a challenge and an opportunity and perhaps a way in which we solve that in that people like these that are taking up so much utilization are not necessarily, we're not going to resolve that just through medical care, right, just through our traditional mechanisms for medical care. So let's go ahead and finish with the last question, and then we will open it up for Q&A. And that is um, this, this notion of, and I think as, as maybe, uh, Dale, you've already queued up for us, you know, with the change and with the business model changing and the payment reforms underway and continuing to absolutely continue, you know, for many, many more years, there are likely going to be winners and losers. And so the question is, who are likely going to be the winners and losers, especially here in Southern California? And we naturally, you know, we naturally think about safety net providers. I don't, you don't need to pick out the specific names, but you know, who are we risking in the midst of all of this? And or who's going to win and who's going to lose as we think about the long-term implications of reform? In short, I would say, um, it's going to sound a little obvious for me to say this, but those that are going to be the winners are those who are going to be able to be innovative, who are going to be able to really aggregate services um, between the physicians, between the uh, hospitals, the aftercare components, et cetera, and manage it uh, well. And obviously there's going to need to be some significant innovation to do that. Um, there will also be those who are able to invest back into their communities in ways that help to decrease poverty uh, to help help people have um, lives where they are not leaning on whether it's the cigarettes or the you know drinking or whatever 
um, and costing the system more money in that way. Um, so again, it comes back to uh, innovation, scale, and the ability to really think outside the proverbial box as it relates to how do we align incentives, um, how do we ensure that we're uh, working closely on behalf of the patient, put the patient first, and I think that will sort of lead those who are going to be the most successful. Dr. Allen, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I can't really speak as well to the safety net providers. I just really haven't uh, been in that space. So um, it is an important subset to keep mm -hmm. whole. Uh, Thank that, you. By the way. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for the dollar. Too. He's going to keep you whole. <laughs> uh, so, but um, th those that can innovate fast enough and respond. And I, and I think I have seen even large organizations um, I know aren't going to make it. I know they're not. I know I've, I've talked to the people that have worked inside them, and I know what their innovation engine is like, and they're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's how fast can you flex, and what's your internal, uh, you know, are you, are you, internally do you, do you incentivize innovation or stagnation? Mm -hmm. yeah. So in the midst, so it's a kind of, a, it dovetails into the consolidation thing we were in earlier, but it's about execution. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's a couple of factors. I think it's one, are you nimble? Is your organization move, you know, can you move quickly? Because you have to move quickly to address the changing needs within your market. I really believe safety net hospitals are probably going to be just fine because there's going to be people out there, there's too much political pressure to keep safety nets going. I think safety nets are the ones that are, should be okay. The ones that are going to have a problem, just like, in, just like we, in, in the United States, we tend to be able to find, we, you know, resources to take care of the poor. But the people that are just over that poverty line have a problem, right? Yeah. And I think that's the same way in healthcare. When you look at hospitals, the hospitals that are the ones that are struggling the most are the ones that kind of mirror their communities, and some of them are struggling. The ones that are innovative, that are nimble, that are be able to do the kinds of things to move quickly to address the needs um, within their organization to say, how do I financially survive today, but how do I position myself to survive in the future? Those are the ones that I think are, are going to be able to survive. Again, hospitals, you're going to just need a lot less beds. If you look at the go government's looking at, you need 30% less beds in the United States. That doesn't mean you're a loser. It means that you have to innovate and evolve into a different organization. And maybe the solution is saying, yeah, we need less beds, but maybe if we have two organizations that come together, we'll take post-acute, we'll, we'll do other things. <laughs> And we're morphing together. I mean, I think there, those kinds of things are going to have to be in, in people's vocabularies to look at how do I change to be able to adapt to a new environment. So that nimbleness needs to be in, is going to be an important consideration. And I think organizations are going to have to be able to do that effectively to survive. Some organizations, you know, they're both in terms of their reputation, their service area, their market, the services they offer, they're going to be able to do just fine. It's the ones in the middle to the low middle that are going to struggle. Interesting. Great. All right, so we're now at a place in the agenda where we do want to open it up to the audience for questions and answers. So I've got a question right here in the front. Uh, sure. Going back to your spending uh, cost curve discussion, you touched on uh, aligning incentives, you touched on sorry, cost effectiveness research, thank you, and you touched on incentives to innovate. So in this post ACA world where we shift from volume to value, uh, providers must now try to maximize clinical effectiveness relative to a fixed budget. The concern for most healthcare stakeholders is that uh, under this new paradigm, value simply becomes a euphemism for cost, rather than constituting a healthy balance between cost, patient outcomes, and quality. So uh, I think the ultimate fear here is that uh, providers in their decision making move closer towards a European style cost effectiveness model which USC Schaefer Center research has shown over and over again, actually threatens US health technology innovation, not incentivizing it. So as providers in this post-ACA world, what do your organizations do to ensure that cost, quality, and patient outcomes are all considered in the delivery of care? <laughs> in a clinically integrated model, and we're, again, this organization, Providence Partners for Health, we've got, a, again, nearly 1,000 doctors in this thing now. The doctors ha have an ability to share on different planes. One is 
non-Medicare patients and being able to look at that and how can we share on, on cost savings. But the government and, and in, you know, I think it's wise to look at it this way, are saying you have to show qualitative improvements. If you don't show qualitative improvements, you can't share. So I think if you use those kinds of models moving forward, right, you're going to have to look at those kinds of things. Plus, realistically, if you're not showing qualitative improvements, it's going to generally cost you, you know, there, there are cost issues associated with it. So there is going to be that, that correlation. Right now, you're right. I mean, right now when we look at what does, you know, quality is sometimes a euphemism for cost controls. But in the future, I think if you have the right incentives, and I think that's where it's at, if you make sure those incentives are there for quality improvements, that's gonna, it's going to be the important factor. And the other issue is patients still have choice. If you have a poor provider or if you have a poor hospital that's not delivering those services, I can choose to go somewhere else. And I may get away with it you know, for a little bit of time, but in the long run, it's going to catch up to you, and that patient's going to vote with their feet. Um, Go ahead. We've got a question. Or, or, did I you want to speak? Yeah, no, yeah. I had a comment on it. So, uh, um, you have to look at what um, it would be nice if we were all egalitarian and, and it was our mission. We're doctors and, and we just did the right thing and we spent billions of dollars to do it. But with limited money in the system, that you really can't get too far out ahead on that. So, look at the underlying drivers of quality. One is the CDF story, is a good example. <clears throat> readmission rate reduction is a good, there's a lot of bad quality that happens that leads to high readmit rates. So it's a purely financial incentive, but quality is definitely incentivized there. And you do have to watch out. Um, you, normally your quality, uh, if you just had financial incentives, that, that would be the end of the quality, is anything that, that was clinical quality that affected utilization. But there is there is um, an acknowledgement by the feds and, and employer groups and, and even marketing, voting with your feet incentives that um, that you have to put financial dollars, you have to put financial incentives to quality. So if you look at the star rating as an example for the Medicare Advantage, um, that's, that has a bunch of quality indicators and if you don't meet it, the whole point of the star rating was to create a Darwinian process where you did not get as many benefits uh, the following year. So theoretically you would start to go down as far as volume and then you got more money. So you'd go up as far as revenue uh, or down as far as revenue. Um, so it, you want the good to succeed and the bad to, to fail. And so I think the, the, the government is pretty much, they, they know not to incentivize pure, purely financially. One of the things you touched on was the potential for stifling innovation. And um, to give you an example of uh, something that's not new technology any longer, of course, but something that is um, important, I think, to the process is if you take a look at uh, basically robotics. Um, if you do a um, radical prostatectomy or a hysterectomy uh, using uh, robotics, um, you're looking at a scenario of a patient staying in uh, the hospital for maybe two days, two plus days. Uh, if you do it open, you're probably looking at more like a five, seven day stay. And under the um, prior or legacy method methodologies of payment where you're really looking at a per diem payment with stop loss or something like that, there was really no financial incentive to um, do a um, robotic procedure except that, hey, we're innovative, we're, you know, et cetera, providing the, the best quality, uh, best service to our, our patients. But financially, there wasn't that incentive there. If you go then to whether you want to call it a DRG type payment case rate um, uh, or a capitated type model, you're looking at a scenario of how quickly can I get this patient out of the hospital? which enhances, obviously, the experience for the patient somewhat significantly. And even though there's some additional upfront cost, it gets made up easily by the fact that you're getting that patient out of that hospital bed significantly earlier. So in many ways, uh, the new payment methodologies, I believe, can enhance uh, the drive towards innovation in ways that it ultimately provides better care for those patients. Okay, do we have time for one more question? I think we've got a question in the back here. I'm the chief compliance officer for a very large health system here in California. And uh, I've heard certain words tonight is innovation, nimble, consolidation, all of those big then also partnerships and what have you. Can you speak to the climate about uh, compliance, what you're doing in regard to compliance, to assure that as you move quickly, there's not any reminders from the government in the form of dollars that reminds you to move too fast in terms of trying to meet this curve. So could you speak to compliance in terms of what you're doing? Steve, to start. 
You know, um, what you're touching on is um, something that hits to potentially policy issues. Um, you know, what we're doing at Loma Linda is we have a very um, significant investment in compliance uh, to make sure that we're auditing, reviewing, ensuring that we're playing by the rules. Um, again, as you know, a mission-based, uh, not-for-profit organization, um, we're doing our best to try and ensure that we are compliant always. But when we take a look at, um, say, in California, the fact that hospitals cannot hire physicians, that makes it challenging for us to move towards the idea of really aligning those incentives. We have to look at other ways to do it, and there are ways to make that happen, but to some degree it's potentially utilizing workarounds. There are other things as it relates to, again, policy that we could probably take a look at to try and streamline the ability to innovate, streamline the ability to um, move forward with quality metrics, et cetera, that wouldn't um, be socially unacceptable. And I think it's going to be important for um, executives uh, and individuals in this room to try and look at what are those um, components of how we can better streamline uh, what we're doing from a healthcare standpoint to ensure, again, protection of the patient, um, ensure that nobody's taking advantage of the system, yet at the same time help us to be more innovative in quicker ways uh, to do more with the dollars that we're entrusted with. Mine will be a very short answer. We're a public company, so I mean the the dollars are going of with being non-compliant and the hurt and the threat to the business is huge. My prior company was public as well, so I think that level of scrutiny of Sarbanes-Oxley and all of these the other things that come along with it uh, kind of take care of itself. It is infused throughout Davida Healthcare Partners with central compliance teams, videos, it, it, and training, and and a lot of mandatory uh, oversight of policies and procedures. It infuses the organization. So I worked for over 20 years in for-profits. And I can tell you, and I worked in a hospital that did things the right way, but because of the issues that the organization had, we were bound by a corporate, federal corporate integrity agreement. And you know, and you learn what pain is a little bit when that happens because you're bound by certain requirements and restrictions, even though you had nothing to do with the, the issues. Providence it has a corporate compliance program. We have a regional compliance program, and every hospital has a a compliance officer. You have required audits that are going in, and we just uh, took over the sponsorship of St. John's. The first thing we did was send a compliance team in to make sure you're looking at those things, both before and after, and ongoing audits that happen. And we review the results of that, and every two weeks I meet with our chief compliance officer in the region to get an update on the status. So again, th there's too much at risk if you don't have a good compliance program. Well, uh, I would like you to join me in thanking our panel for a really excellent discussion.